Welcome to Seismic Sound Off, exploring the depth and usefulness of geophysics for the scientific community and the public. I'm your host, Andrew Gary. And in this episode, I speak with Cyril Jiadong Batin on his SEG field camp investigating the slave trade in southeastern Ghana using integrated geophysical techniques. Recently, there has been renewed interest in connecting Africans in the diaspora to their ancestral lands. In this context, significant focus has been placed on research which enhances an understanding of the circumstances of enslaved people during the days of enslavement. A lesser known and often excluded slavery focus point is the southeastern part of Ghana. In this conversation, Cyril explains the concept behind the term the archaeology of slavery. He describes the various geophysical investigations used across four communities. Cyril also elaborates on how this type of project encourages the current and future generations of geophysicists. This conversation highlights the significant value geophysics brings to a problem and how SEG field camps in particular are an invaluable tool for building the next generation of scientists and providing humanitarian benefits. To find links to the poster for this field camp and to donate to this program, visit seg.org slash podcast or check out the show notes where you're listening now. Let's get to my conversation with Cyril Giadong Boateng. We are speaking with you about the field camp you led, and it was titled Investigating the Slave Trade in Southeastern Ghana Using Integrated Geophysical Techniques. I want to focus on the southeastern Ghana part there. Why is this part of Ghana for this project particularly important? Ghana is really one of one of the places in Africa that has the the highest number of forts and castles uh, built by the Europeans outside of Europe. Um, that's, it's like one of the places with the highest number of castles and forts. So this is because of all the trade that um, the Euro- Europeans had with um, uh, Africans a couple of hundred years ago. So for the coastal part of Ghana, especially the western part, uh, because of the presence of these forts and castles, a lot of research has been done about how that is connected with slavery and all that. Now, there are some parts of Ghana that research has not been done at all because um, people didn't really associate those places with um, the transatlantic slave trade. So uh, we focused on southeastern Ghana because this is one of those places where research had not been done at all. So it was like it was um, a virgin place we could go and look at and see whether, yes, there, there are traces of the transatlantic slave trade compared with the other side of Ghana where there's been so much work done just because of the dominating effects of the forts and castles. So that's why we focused on Southeastern Ghana. Yeah, that's kind of a, I'm sure that was also exciting for the 52 students that worked on this project to do something totally brand new. And speaking of the work you were doing, can you explain what you mean by the archaeology of slavery? Yes, um, slavery of course, happened hundreds, a couple of hundreds of years ago, yes. Uh, That's when slavery ended. And then what happened was um, a lot of the stories and what we know about slavery, it's usually written down by by the the slave masters or those who were actually taking the slaves. So we don't have a lot of information about how the slaves themselves lived, how they were captured, what kind of food they ate, all that kind of stuff. So the archaeology of slavery deals with how we can investigate those kind of things about how the people lived, how the, how the enslaved people lived, how they were captured, how they were transported down from wherever they were taken from to the shore and then put on a ship. And then trying to get a holistic understanding of that in terms of um, um, history. So that's what the archaeology of slavery is really about. And why is geophysics particularly helpful in this type of investigation? Yeah, so geophysics is very helpful because... Because these things happened some years ago, uh, the things you are looking for, like relics, like even identifying sites that were used as maybe a slave holding site or um, even a um, fort that has broken down, we can use geophysics to identify some of these artifacts and all these things which may be buried under the ground because, we, because it's some years since this happened. So geophysics comes there because it, as a tool, geophysics can be used to map uh, the subsurface 
Uh, we can use it to delineate where, for instance, relics are. We can use it to even understand uh, um, a site, maybe which was a slave market and how people were kept there, the shackles that were used that may be buried, stuff like that. So that's how geophysics comes into play for this research, for this field camp. Does the type of geophysics you want to utilize in this instance change depending on how large or small the item you are trying to find in the subsurface is? Yes. So in this kind of geophysics, we are looking at near surface geophysics. So we are looking at um, uh, ground penetrating radar. We use resistivity, the magnetic method, of course. So resolution is very important because the things we are looking for are not too big. We, we need um, tools that can get us the resolution to be able to identify this artifact. So yes, the, the kind of things you are looking for is really important. What was the main goal of your field camp? So, so we had the main goal, of, of course, because of the field camp was to advance the field of geophysics. And then we also wanted to train students, a, a new generation of geoscientists. And then another one was to just apply um, geophysics to the archaeology of slavery something which hadn't been done before, because I think this field camp was the very first time Ghanaians um, here, like Africans, have used this, uh, have used geophysics to explore the, the archaeology of slavery in Ghana. It, it had never been done. So we wanted to combine all this, three, train, the, train a young, uh, new generation of geoscientists, and then be able to advance the field of geophysics in the communities we visited, and then also do the research as well. Yeah, you ended up working across four communities, which wasn't the initial plan. Could you describe some of the investigations you did across these four sites? Yeah, so let, so there was one interesting site um, called Hejana that we went to. And um, the interesting thing about this site was that um, because we were engaging the community, um, actually a praise from the community had um, approached us and, and told us, gave us an oral account of the history of the area. And apparently, his family, which is still like the royal family of that area, had, had been key players in the slave trade hundreds of years ago. And they still live in the same place. They, they are, they are, like the family still lives in the same place. So apparently, during um, when slavery was abolished, because it was now wrong to practice any form of slavery or to go capture anybody, what they were doing was that they decided to bury all the, the, the tools they were using for the trade like the shackles they were using, the chains and all that. So there's um, a running story in the family that they, they dug a big hole in the middle of the courtyard in the, fam in the family house and then buried all of this stuff in there, right? But after a couple of years, the family does not really remember exactly where this was buried. So it was interesting because, the, 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 because we were out there doing this work and he heard about us. He approached us and told us about this story and then... Uh, we went to the house uh, to try and locate uh, possible areas where these artifacts were buried. So that's, that's one of the, the sites we went to. And then the second one was a fort, which was also in the area, um, in one of the communities, which was the last place the slaves were kept before being shipped um, offshore in a town called Keta. So uh, for the very first time, we, we went into the fort and tried to locate some of the places, especially in the courtyards, where supposedly uh, slaves who died were, were buried and all that. So those are some of the things we did in the communities we went to. You kind of talk about it there, how this family approached you to, to kind of learn about what was going on in, in their own family generations ago. How, how did the four communities react to this project, especially as you mentioned, this is, you know, maybe this is an underexplored area in this part of Ghana? Yeah, so initially there was some resistance because people didn't really understand um, what we were about to do. And then, of course, you can understand that th there are two groups of people in these communities today. Some are descendants of the enslaved and some were part of those who were doing the, um, the enslavement. So some families were not too happy about uh, bringing these issues up. And then some families were excited because they felt this would be a good way to, to explore history and understand what was going on. So what we did was, I think the very first few, the few the first days we went there, we, we approached the traditional authorities. We spoke to uh, the king of that area, his, uh, his courtiers, and, and 
And then we, we talked to the community as well. We approached um, families, spoke to them, and educated them about what we are about to do. And then subsequently, they were fascinated about the project and families started approaching us just like the example I gave and then volunteering information. So some of the sites that we went to by the end of the project, we had a really plan for them. But just because the people were so excited about the, the field camp, they started approaching us about information and telling us about uh, giving us oral accounts that had run in families for generations and then we were able to explore some of those things. What were the outcomes of this field camp? Yeah, so I think the, for me, the, 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 the main outcome is, is the training of students because then for a lot of our students, and, and we had students from different universities in Ghana and then some from outside Ghana as well. So for, for most of our students, this was the very first time they had practical experience outside of the classroom where they go to a field, come for around about two weeks and then get to use the equipment and see results and analyze the results, interpret the results. So for me, one of the most important outcomes was the training of students. And then the, the other part for me that was really exciting was that we got to really advance the field of geophysics by speaking to the community. So in all the communities we went to, we engaged the communities. We went to schools in the communities. We spoke to them about the field of geophysics. And uh, by the end of our outreach programs, um, we were able to get some students say, oh, yeah, I think I would like to take up geophysics as a program when I get to the university. So that was a, a secondary outcome that I was really happy about. And of course, we were also able to then locate some sites, potential sites for excavation. And one of the good things is that we're partnering with the University of Ghana, yeah, the Department of Archaeology and Heritage Studies. So they are going to follow up on what we've done and then get to establish those areas and then get to explore the potential of setting up um, uh, museums or uh, tourist centers or even places of learning for the communities to continue learning about their history. That's, that's uh, some incredible outcomes there. And you, you talked about some of these, what is happening on with the students, uh, but based on there were 52 students that you listed that worked on this project, which is a huge number of people. What were some of their, what were some of the student takeaways from working on this field camp? Oh, yeah. So, so for, for the students, the, the key takeaways were the fact that you just get to work in an actual field, um, field setting. So like I was saying, some of the students have never experienced this. So you are like, what will happen if you are working uh, with a company that is going to do field work? You are in the field for oh, almost two weeks. You are there with the um, other colleagues. Um, you have to learn to live together. You have to learn to work together on the field. You learn how to print the equipment. You get your data, you have to download the data, process the data, interpret the data. So for most students, they were just, the practical experience of going through this, this process was really good. Others also had felt that they, they had never really, um, especially for, we had archaeology students. And they, they for instance, said, um, we had been learning archaeology all the time uh, in class, but we didn't really know we had how to apply geophysics tools to what we were doing. So this was like a different um, angle altogether for it was an eye opener for them. So I think those were the key takeaways um, for the students at least, yeah. What did you find personally, what accomplishment in this field camp brings you the most joy? Mm, I think those are so many, <laughs> but let, let me I'll give you a few. So one of the key ones is the fact that where we went to the, the, the southeastern part of Ghana, that region is my home region. But I didn't, for instance, know that there was a lot of, we had a lot of sites related to the transatlantic slave trade in that part of Ghana. I didn't know. This field camp was part of a learning process for, for me. So that was one of the things. The second thing was the, the opportunity to conduct outreach to young students, people in basic school, and then people in um, secondary schools to tell them about geophysics and what geophysics can be used for. And then just finding out about the, the history of the place that was kind of hidden. People didn't, it was literally digging deep and revealing history that was hidden from view. So for me, that was really, really, really one of the key things for me on this field now. Yeah, it's pretty incredible to be able to use your knowledge and expertise of geophysics for something like this to uncover and discover something as well. What led you to 
lead, choose to lead this field camp? The field camp, let's put it this way. So I've been engaged in geophysics outreach over time. Yes, yeah, since, since I started doing geophysics. But for this particular field camp, I felt that it was an opportunity to train my students because my, I, I felt that was a, a limitation in when we train our students in terms of their field experience. And, and the other thing is, like I mentioned, I'm interested in um, contributing to um, sustainable development. And this field camp just gave me the opportunity to be able to lead in that aspect where we can explore some of helping in achieving some of the sustainable development goals like uh, inequality, sustainability, and all that. What would you like the listening audience to know about the SEG field camps? I think the SEG field camp is, is an incredible program uh, because it would have been really, really challenging getting funding to uh, organize such a thing. So for it's been incredible that um, we can get funds from the SEG Foundation on this project and then be able to touch so many students, touch a whole community, and then also be able to conduct research as well. So I think the SEG Field Camp is an incredible program, and, and I hope it will be sustained for a long time. A few general questions here to, to end the conversation. What do you hope to achieve through your scientific work? Okay, so that's interesting. Yes, um, I came back to Ghana, I think, two years ago um, in the middle of COVID. I, I had just finished um, a postdoc study um, in, in China. And I remember when I was coming back, one of the key things I thought was um, if there was any way I could contribute to, to the development of Ghana, that would be really be great. So I thought it was an opportunity to come back and contribute what I had learned outside and all the years of experience that I gathered. So this full camp was part of that process to say that, okay, the knowledge that you've gathered, you could um, apply it in a totally different area and then this area could really help in terms of unraveling the history of Ghana and then get people to think about things in a new way, understand um, the heritage of slavery, the archaeology of slavery, and then maybe moving forward, it can inform how, um, how we see ourselves um, as Africans and then how we relate to the rest of the world. You, know, you are a, a big reader, Cyril. What is your most recommended or gifted book? That's an interesting question. <laughs> so I think I have so many books, but I'd say that because I'm a Christian, probably the, the most influential book in my life would be the Bible, uh, because then uh, most of the things I do um, in seven, I, I feel that come from that angle that uh, you need to serve people and um, you are brought on earth to serve true science um, through all the work that you do. So I, I think that'll be the most influential. Well, you are clearly living that out and, and doing what you're you're doing with this field camp. And and kind of lastly here, what principal teaching or point of view has helped you succeed in your field? Oh, oh never to give up. So that that would be the, the, the most important thing for, for me. It's it's really challenging sometimes um putting things together here in Ghana. I, I think in Anything that you want to do that is worthwhile will really be difficult. Uh, we'll have challenges along the way. So the most important thing for me that has kept me going is that you, you don't give up. If you think something is worth doing and you think it can, it can change things, then you should not give up. You just, you just keep getting at it. You, you can change the, the way you are doing it. You can change the, the approach and everything. But if you feel really feel that something is worthwhile, keep at it and keep taking small steps, baby steps, and then one day you achieve the goal. Is there anything I should have asked that I did not? Yeah, so, so one of the fascinating things about the field camp, which I think even our students got uh, a lot from, is that we got the opportunity to explore even the culture of the areas we went to. So some of the field camps, some of the places, the communities we visited, for you to even um, go to some of the sites, you needed, you needed them to get the traditional authorities or the, the, let's say, the religion of the area, the priests of the religion of the area to go and uh, pray and have special rituals. And that was a fascinating thing. So even though we were on a quest for signs, uh, the students and then the team members got to experience things that they were not really used to, that they would not really have seen, even though this was part of the African traditional religion. So... Uh, on the whole, I think 
this field can give us the opportunity not just to experience geophysics, but to experience history, to experience uh, uh, the African traditional religion, and then to experience just science communication uh, on a different level. Yeah, that engagement with community is is so important in any of these geophysical projects out in the field. So I, I'm sure they will take that away from them. I appreciate your your time explaining this amazing field camp, and I look forward to seeing what kind of kind of work you do in the future. Thank you, uh, Andrew. Um, thank you for the chance to speak to you and then to to your audience about the work that we've done. Um, I, I'm really appreciative of that. You reached the end of Seismic Sound Off. Thank you for listening to this episode. If you want to be the first to know about the next episode, please follow or subscribe to the podcast wherever you listen to podcasts. Two of my favorites are Apple Podcasts and Spotify. If you have episode ideas, feedback for the show, or want to sponsor a future episode, visit seg.org slash podcast and find the box titled Contact Seismic Sound Off. Zach Bridges created original music for this show. This episode was hosted, edited, and produced by me, Andrew Gary at Treasurement. The SEG podcast team is Jennifer Cobb, Kathy Gamble, and Ali McGinnis. Thank you for listening. This is Seismic Sound Off, signaling off. <laughs>